so uh, this uh, time we're going to discuss about the OSCE. I know we are having uh, one uh, course, but unfortunately, I will not be around uh, during that period as I'll be in a conference. So that is why I decided that we'll do this uh, on uh, uh, online, basically. So we're going to present some questions. Okay, so this is the first question. Um, uh, so in this, there's a clinical picture. Uh, the questions are enumerate the components of this deformity. What is the pathomechanics of this deformity? What is the compensatory mechanism evident in this photograph? And describe the likely gait pattern in this case. So if you can see what you can see, what we can see is that there is a, the heel, which is very prominent. Okay. And then there is, a, you know, a slightly higher arch. And at the same time, there is some deformity in the big toe also. So this high arch means basically it is a cavus foot. Now, if you look over here, I mean, this cavus foot is not primarily due to the first metatarsal pronation. Uh, the whole, uh, all the toes are basically equally plant of legs. Uh, in cases of pest cavus, which is due to first metatarsal pronation due to uh, a mismatch between the tibialis uh, uh, anterior and peroneus longus, like in uh, hereditary sensory motor neuronopathies or uh, in charcot meritor disease, you would see that the first metatarsal is actually more plantar flex and it is more prominent, it is pronated, which isn't the case in this case. The heel is prominent, this is because of the deformity which is arising from the hind foot. So basically, this is a pest cavus which is arising due to a hind foot calcaneus deformity uh, and this is what is uh, uh, seen in this. So what are the deformities seen? One is a pest cavus. Uh, we cannot say whether it's a cavo varus foot. It does not appear to be one, but cavo varus foot is typically seen in those which are uh, in which the pest cavus arises from the uh, from the floor forefoot, in which there is a forefoot pronation primarily. So this has pest cavus in which you have a calcaneus at the hind foot. You have a, a, an increased plantar flexion at the forefoot. Uh, you have, uh, uh, you may have a tight, uh, uh, you may have a loose uh, or a weak uh, tibial, tib tendo at least. And you have a deformity in the big toe. Now, if you look at the big toe closely, I mean, there is no hyperextension at the first, uh, you know, at the MTP joint. But what we can see is only a flexion at the interphalangeal joint. So it is more of a mallet toe deformity in the big toe. If it was a hyperextended, uh, uh, you know, uh, first MTP joint, it would have been a cloto deformity. So, what is the pathomechanics path of this deformity? Um, so, this deformity has happened because there is a mismatch between the dorsiflexor and the plantar flexor. So, the dorsiflexor is strong and the plantar flexor is weak, which is causing the hind foot to go into a calcaneus deformity, which is just the opposite of the equinus deformity in which tendo achilles is tight so in this case the tendo achilles or a gastrosoleus complex is weak which is causing the uh, hind foot to go into calcaneus deformity and you would see an increased calcaneal pitch in these cases which would be the primary deformity what are the compensatory mechanism evident in this photograph so first compensatory mechanism is that the forefoot or the metatarsals they go into the plantar flexion to maintain the foot uh, tripod and when they go into the plantar flexion it is all the five metatarsals they all go into the plantar flexion which is lead which leads to the high arch or the cavus foot deformity and at the same time there is uh, uh, you know an increase because of the weak uh, tendo achilles the long toe flexors uh, basically they are uh, over uh, they are overactive and they overpower and that is what leads to the malato deformity in this case Describe the likely gait pattern in this case, since the Achilles tendon would is expected to be weak in this case. So these patient or these this patient would have a calcaneus gait. So let's look at the answer key now. So the def, uh, deformities, if we ask, it is pest cavus, hind foot calcaneus, and the mallet big toe, which I just described. So the main problem is the gastrosoleus weakness. With the normal tibialis anterior uh, tendon, which leads to the calcaneus deformity, and pest cavus is caused due to overaction of long toe flexors during the gait, which leads to 
the plantar flexion of the metatarsals or the plantar flexion of the forefoot, which is leading to the cavus and overactivity of FHL leading to the mallet, big toe, calcaneus gait due to lack of push off due to the weakness of the gastrosoleus is the gait pattern in this case. So uh, uh, next question. So this is a X-ray is shown. A 40 year old male sustained this injury two years ago. He now presented with deformity and persistent pain over the sinus tarsi region. What are the clinical features expected in this case? What could be the causes of pain? Describe the procedure for clinical evaluation of subtalar movement and what is the treatment of intractable pain in such a case? So if you can see uh, on this x-ray, you can see that this is a patient who had a history of calcaneal fracture. So as a result, there are uh, findings which are evident, which is uh, it is a lateral view. So you can see there is evidence of subtalar arthritis. Uh, the heel height has reduced. The heel length also has reduced. Uh, we cannot appreciate, uh, you know, the heel varus, which can be associated in this case also. And there is, because of the decrease in the heel height, there is a slightly uh, increase uh, in the, there is a change in the tailored dec declination angle also, though it is not very significant. But if you can see that the tailors is actually pointing uh, upwards. Okay, so there is a reduction in the Taylor declination angle. So these are the radiological findings. If someone asks you, what are the clinical features which are expected in this case? Uh, the patient's clinical features, the main symptoms, first of all, it would be pain, uh, pain which would be on mostly on the lateral side due to subtalar arthritis or the pain secondary to peroneal tendonitis. The patient would have stiffness in the hind foot, especially in the subtalar joint with limited movement, inability to move on the, um, and inability to uh, move on the uneven surface with associated pain. The patient may have a restricted ankle dorsiflexion also in these cases, uh, and uh, anterior ankle impingement due to the change in the tailor declination angle. Um, and the patient would have a deformity, so it would be a heel varus associated with in this case. So what are the causes of pain in this case? The patient would have a, a pain arising due to the subtalar arthritis. They can be due to peroneal tendinopathy. The pain can be in the anterior ankle due to the, uh, due to the uh, anterior ankle impingement. Uh, and also the patient may have nerve related pain uh, if there is a out uh, blown uh, medial wall. Uh, which is relatively layer, or uh, if the outblown, outblown lateral wall is causing impingement of the sural nerve. So patient may have a tarsal tunnel syndrome medially or a sural neuritis laterally. The procedure for clinical evaluation of subtalar movement, and it is a two marks question, so uh, which you have to describe at least two procedures. So one is a assessment of the subtalar jointers when you hold the ankle into neutral position or in ankle in dorsiflexion, you try to move the subtalar joint by holding the heel uh, in subtalar joint into inversion and eversion. And the second way would be by doing a double heel raise test to see for flexibility of the subtalar joint in which normally you would have a slight valgus and as the patient goes onto the uh, onto his uh, toes, uh, the subtalar joint would invert and the heel would go into inversion and will return inwards. What is the treatment of intractable pain in such a case? The treatment of intractable pain in such a case is a subtalar arthrodesis. If you want to go further ahead, I mean, it depends upon the cause of the symptoms. You can even expand it further by saying you can do an exostectomy of the lateral wall. You can do a subtalar arthrodesis and in cases of anterior ankle impingement, you can do a distraction bone block subtalar arthrodesis. So uh, clinical features, uh, you have a shortened, broadened heel, which is also into varus, stiffness due to limited subtalar movement, lateral sided pain arising out of the subtalar joint or peroneal tendon, and nerve-related pain, neuritis, tingling sensation, or paresthesia in posterior tibial nerve and sural nerve. Uh, the cause of pain is subtalar arthritis and peroneal tendon uh, or subluxation uh, or tendon impingement. 
सबटेलर जॉइंट असेसमेंट सिंगल और डबल हील रेस टेस्ट एंड इन्वर्जन